you very much. Thank you. Do I, I've got my, have, am I switched on? Can you hear me? Yes, yes hooray. <laughs> Thanks very much for that introduction. Um, so here we, this, we hear an awful lot about um, the literature of, the, of Ireland, Southern Ireland. We don't hear very much about the new literature of Northern Ireland. Is that a fair thing for me to say? My perspective is obviously not the same as your perspective, being right in the middle of it. <laughs> yeah, I think an interesting thing is uh, my first novel was published um, 17 years ago, so almost 20 years ago. Um, and I've seen the literary landscape change so much over those couple of decades. I think it's undeniable that we are in a golden age of Irish writing in all forms. You know, people redefining what the short story can do, what the essay can do, novels, um, TV, uh, across all literary forms. But I'm sure Jan would agree with me that um, if you're a northern writer, um, quite often you're, you see lists of, you know, the, the, the 20 Irish writers you should read. Quite often, Northerners aren't on that, um, especially if you're a Northern woman. But I think the thing that has changed most and uh, most positively in my writing life um, is the, the, the... It's not that the Northern woman writers haven't always been there. You know, Jennifer Johnson, um, Deirdre Madden, they just haven't always had their had Jews. And there were two brilliant sister anthologies by Sinead Gleeson um, published that were really canon-defying and really seemed to change the landscape. Um, celebrating Irish women writers. Jan and I were on a panel together, what the audience were saying, where's ours in, in the North? And after that, there was another anthology solely focusing on Northern women. So I think that's, um, I've seen some of this change happen myself, um, been part of it with some of my own editing. And it, it seems to me that at the moment, Northern writing is where the real energy is on the island as a whole. No bias at all. No, no, completely, yeah, quite, from an observer. I would say also, um, quite often, writers who you think are just Irish are actually from the North. So, you know, people like Maggie O'Farrell and um, Anna Burns and Louise Kennedy and Michael McGee, they're all from our tribe up in the North, but they often get swept up in the bigger Irish canon. And that's to do with how people identify in Northern Ireland, it's a complex thing to be Northern Irish, and some people are more comfortable with saying they're Irish rather than Northern Irish. Some people want to identify as British, some people want to identify as specifically Northern Irish, so you've got the whole range. Mm -hmm. What I will say is I don't think it's just a golden age for writing in the north of Ireland. I think in the arts in general, it has been a pretty good decade. We have brought home a Booker, the Turner Prize, an Oscar, the T.S. Eliot, the Forward, and for a tiny little like lump of land stuck up in the car park of Europe, as I like to call it, um, I think we've been like punching above our weight for quite a while. Yeah, and this, despite the lack of um, investment in the arts, really, is there a lack figures, of investment? Can, if you look at the figures, these aren't. I'm not quoting exact, but these are ballpark figures. Um, Republic of Ireland, I think there's about a 20, maybe more um, pounds per capita. Um, Wales, 12. Um, Northern Ireland about five. Right, so, so, right, so we're talking Northern a, Ireland. Yeah. I'm on the Arts Council, the Irish Arts Council. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I can give you the panel that gives lots of money out. It's I can so give you the exact wonderful. stats for that. So <laughs> the most that a Northern Irish artist can get from our Arts Council is £5,000. The most right. that an individual artist in the South can get is €25,000. So that shows you the deficit. Yeah. Um, and it's quite interesting, people like to talk about a kind of all-island approach to the arts, but there are huge financial kind of differences across the border, or the, the non-existent border, or however you want to think of it. So, so why has this happened? What, what is it about? Why has this amazing flowering happened? Uh, we've got a lot to talk about. I mean, there's been quite a bit of news happening in that part of the world for the last uh, 200, 300 forever years. But I think particularly in the last wee while, history, politics, culture is happening so fast in Northern Ireland. And artists are the canaries in the cold mine. And a lot of the work, is, it doesn't have to be, but a lot of the work is politically charged. It has a social conscience. It's responding directly to what is happening in the North now and trying to make sense of the complex past that the North has been through. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, we always joke about this. If, if you're a writer from Northern Ireland and you write a book about fluffy bunnies, you will still get up on stage and some man in the audience will ask you to explain the Good Friday Agreement and the implications of Brexit. 
Like, <laughs> there is this unspoken assumption that Northern Irish writers will be at least politically aware and probably politically eloquent as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that in Ireland as a whole, um, literature and the arts are valued. And you look at the amount of um, magazines like The Stinging Fly, Banshee, The Tangerine, the small presses, and um, the more the more places there are for writers to, to write and practice and be published, the more that culture um, burgeons. And I think as well, the, a lot of the huge change that's been happening in Southern Ireland and in the North, you know, the, the bodily autonomy referendum, the equal marriage referendum, um, all the investigations into the um, abuses at the Magdalene laundries, um, a lot of what's happening is um, people, it's driven by narrative. You know, both of those referendums were won largely by personal narrative. Like, whether or not people should have to tell their intimate stories is another question. But, but a lot of those stories were, a lot, a lot of the change was driven by people telling stories and people um, refusing shame. You know, the great cloak of silencing shame that's been thrown over so much of Irish so much of Ireland, so much of Northern Ireland, you know, whatever you say, say nothing for various reasons. Um, we're now in the North specifically as well. You don't get a book like um, uh, Milkman written in the immediate That's aftermath Anna, of Anna Comfort. Burns. Anna Burns' masterpiece. Um, something like Milkman, it takes the dis, you know, a book like that, the lived experience needs to be distilled, needs to go through the crucible, needs to be understood, needs to be, so I think we're far enough um, now, say, from um, events that, that writers can look at them in different ways. Um, something like Paul McVeigh's book as well, The Good Son, which is about a young boy questioning his sexuality in Ardoy, same, same place as, as Milkman. We're getting stories that um, are untold stories and undertold stories. And that's something that, as a writer, the, the, and the more um, something that happens is you really do benefit from that which your peers are doing. You know, you see other, you, 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 even if their work is very different to yours, um, the, the courage that they have um, gives you courage, and the stories that they tell and the way that they tell them um, ups your game as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's an element of, of that at play as well. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is ask each of them to. Um, read for a little bit from each book because the voices are so very particular mm -hmm. and beautiful um, and should we start with you Jan do, yeah. we, do you want to should we just set up the raptures it just explain what it is about <laughs> if you can do so I'm fighting against the wind here which is actually <laughs> kind of lovely if you are sweltering the front row is a lot cooler than the back row probably <laughs> um, the raptures is set in 1993 in a fictional village outside of Bellamina in the north of um, Ireland. Um, it follows a young girl called Hannah Adger who's 11 years old that summer and Hannah is from a very fundamentalist um, Protestant Christian uh, family and Hannah has been very sheltered her whole life. She thinks that their way of living is really how everyone in the world lives and all of a sudden her all of her kind of uh, presuppositions are thrown into question this summer because a mysterious illness sweeps through the kids in her class and they begin to die one at a time and hannah has to ask some big big questions about what she believes and how you respond to that now saying that 11 children die in this book uh, not an easy sale during a pandemic also it's about presbyterianism not a lot of crack but it's actually quite a funny book as well. I would agree with that. <laughs> Good. Um, I am, um, if I can fight against the wind, I'm going to read you just um, a page and a half, and it's from the begins with Ross, and Ross is the first child to get sick this summer. The only other thing that you need to know is Ballylack is the the village that I have made up, and if you're from Northern Ireland, it's actually Kells. But please don't <laughs> tell my mother that. <laughs> Ross had only just turned 11. He was still a child, though the thought of girls was already pressing. He'd sometimes go through the K's catalogue for pictures of women in bras and pants. He'd yet to touch a girl himself. Had yet to taste coffee or travel anywhere in an aeroplane. He'd been looking forward to Lanzarote. It would have been his first time in a foreign place. Poor Ross. It's never easy going first. There's been no talk of the boys passing yet. It'll be mid-morning before the news spreads. In the houses and farms of Ballylack, people are getting on with their everyday doing. 
They're feeding the cows and drinking tea, watching the telly and heading to bed. There's no expectation that tomorrow will be much different from today. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> 93 has been an unremarkable year and the summer's shaping up to be equally forgettable. It's neither hot nor particularly damp. It isn't a World Cup year or one for the Olympics. Majors in Downing Street, Clinton's in the White House. Folks aren't sure what to make of him. Keep an eye on that one. He's got notions, they like to say. There's talk of Clinton wading into the troubles. Word is, he thinks he can sort it out. Let the same fella have a run at it. Better than him have tried and failed. Down south, Ireland win the Eurovision for the umpteenth year in a row. In your eyes is the song in question. You'd have a hard time dancing to it, though it's got a catchy hook. Makes a change from the usual earnest shite. Plunk, 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 and words about peace. What are the young ones listening to? Shaggy, Ace of Bass, Two Unlimited, Feel Good Euro Hits. They don't sound half so feel good pumping through the tinny speakers at the GAA clubs and community centres where Ulster's youth hang out. Dancing, smoking, drinking cheap vodka decanted into Fanta bottles. No, no limits will reach for the sky, the youngsters sing, fists pumping furiously to the beat, black bomber jackets soaking up the sweat. They go buck mad every time No Limits comes on. Sure, it's only a chin to them, not the call to arms it could be. No Limits indeed. What a load of bollocks. These kids hail from Ocher, Clocher and Cullibaggy. Say it out loud. Cullibaggy. You can practically hear the fences. They couldn't be more limited if they tried. Elsewhere in the province, they're still at it, killing each other with bombs and guns. It's the 23rd or 4th summer of this nonsense. Depends on when you start to keep in count. Most folks are fed up with the whole thing. They're adamant the killing must stop. There's war in Bosnia and Afghanistan. There's a brutal one winding up in Rwanda. You can't turn on your telly for seeing dead bodies piled everywhere. Blood pulling in the gutters. Women howling and getting on. The people here are sick of death. This isn't a third world country. This is Britain. Or this is Ireland. Or both. Or neither. Or its own institution, peculiar as a maiden aunt. Either way, it's a civilised country. It's been a whole two years since McDonald's arrived. <laughs> you get it, but it's such a very particular voice, and I mean voice in both senses. Um, um, that sort of... Um, I was going to ask you, my first question was going to be, did you have... You know, did you sit around for ages saying, which year should you set it in? Or did you immediately know it was going to be 1993 and why? Um, it's 1993 for three reasons. A, because I'm really a lazy researcher and I just wanted to write about a period that I know inside out and didn't have to research which bands were in the charts and what were people wearing. Um, so I'm the same age as Hannah in the, in the book. Hannah's really me, but also do not tell my mother that. Oh, gosh, um, actually, no, you definitely don't want no. to tell your mother that. Um, B... <laughs> 93 was the, 94 is when the first kind of um, significant IRA ceasefire begins. So it was the, there was a movement at that point towards peace. You could feel it kind of in the ether. So there was a lot of thinking about the next generation of young people in Northern Ireland and what we were going to pass on to them. And a huge theme in the book is legacy and what the young people inherit and how they will move on beyond um, the conflict. But the most important third reason was the insularity that you get in 1993. This is before the internet. It's before Ryanair and EasyJet arrived in Belfast. It was desperately hard for people to get out. It was expensive and it was time consuming for folks to get out of Northern Ireland. And unsurprisingly, not many people were coming on holidays to Northern Ireland in 1993. Don't know why. Um, so. It was possible at that point for a young person like Hannah to grow up in a small village with very little concept of what the rest of the world was like. And I wanted to write into that bubble because I don't think an 11 year old or a 13 year old now would have that same kind of tunnel vision. Our kids are much more savvy about what's going on in the rest of the world and even what's going on down the street. You know, for folks who weren't raised in Northern Ireland, you have to understand our school system was incredibly segregated and is still 91% segregated. So Hannah would probably never have met a Catholic. She lives in an area that's all Protestant. She goes to a school that's Protestant. So 
she only has a very narrow view in the world and I wanted to write into that. So can you just describe, you, you, you said it's, it's Ballylac, it's called Ballylac. Um, you know what that means. What does it, what, tell us what it means if we've never been there. We don't know what it means. <laughs> okay, there are three Kelses in Ireland. Uh, two are kind of significant. There's a small one and there's Kells that the Book of Kells came from. And when you're, it's in the south. And when you drive into it, there's a big Virgin Mary in a glass box. Um, and it's a lovely, very friendly village. When you come to Kells in County Antrim, everything that doesn't move is painted red, white, and blue. It has about one street that runs through it, and I think a population of about three and a half thousand. There's seven different denominations of Protestant church in that one street. Um, it has a lot of um, orange men, presence of the Orange Order there, um, a lot of very working class loyalists, really, and that's the world that I grew up in. And around that, a very rural agriculture farming community. So that would have been the world I grew up in. Mm -hmm. So it reminded me, when I was trying to think of the comparators, as we always do, anybody who works in books these days, comparators. And then a really unusual comparators, my comparators were under Milkwood, Dylan Thomas, because you have the, vill the chorus, the village's chorus in it is very important. And um, Beyond Black, Hilary Mantel's Beyond Black. Yeah. Because it's, it's fae. Yeah. <laughs> there are ghosts. Yeah. Um, I just read Beyond Black about six weeks ago, so I, I can answer that. Um, I don't actually love it that much. It was the, the one Hilary Mantel I've struggled with quite a lot. Um, but the Under Milkwood was a, a big influence, particularly because I think Dylan Thomas does an amazing thing with voices there. And I, um, the way I write, I, I like to describe it as a kind of drone. So, you know, like a zzz drone. So sometimes it comes down and it sits very closely on a character's shoulder. And what we're getting is, is still third person, but it's a very, so close that it almost feels like first person at times and you get a sense of the language and the voice. At other times it goes high up and you get an overall view of what's going on in the village and in the context of maybe Northern Ireland and even in that passage, the world. And that gives me a lot of playfulness. And I think Thomas is able to do that as well in Under Milk Woods. So thank you. I will yeah. take that one as a very <laughs> lovely comparison. <laughs> but not Beyond Black. Um, I just got really bored with it. I don't, I don't know. I love Hilary Mantel and I've read most of her books. And I did not love that one. That's very interesting. Um, and I, I'm still thinking about why I didn't love that one. But we'll come back to that. But there, so, so Hannah basically sees... She has a sort of a mystic ability to see the, some of the children who've died. I don't think it's a plot spoiler, is it? Because it starts very no, early I mean, on. This explains it very easily. The novel is based on the story of the Pied Piper of Hamelin. That's where I start it. So Hannah's the only child who survives this epidemic that sweeps through the children. And I was always interested in what happens in the Pied Piper when he comes back. The people of Hamelin don't pay him for his services and he comes back and he takes all their children away. And one child is lame and she can't keep up. And what does that mean to be peculiarly blessed because you've not been stolen, but also kind of left out? And I, I also was always fascinated by what happened to the children. Did they go to a beautiful place or a scary place? And in this book, the kids get to come back from the place they've gone to to tell Hannah what it's like. And you, you, it's not the first time you, you, you've used sort of supernatural figures before in your in your work, haven't you? What what is this about? Um, I, I'm a magical realist. Do, do you think of it as magic realism? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I wrote instinctively like that for a long time without knowing. I'm completely self-taught, so I didn't know about the genre. And then I went back and read up. And I, you know, magical realism is a, it, it's a, a genre that sprung from colonial and post-colonial situations. And I'm kind of shocked that there's not more of it in Ireland, Northern Ireland, because we have such a complex history with colonialism. And I also, we have a huge, like, kind of, bedrock of mythology and legend and yet if you look back the last 50 years of Irish literature has been completely dominated by literary realism and that flies in the face of things like Bram Stoker and Flann O'Brien and even Samuel Beckett there was an element of kind of the speculative to what he was doing so yeah so but you're more of a realist 
Lucy. Funnily, I'm more of a realist, but um, <laughs> when I teach writing, I, I taught um, Jan Carson and Brian Moore and magical realism for so long that I find myself writing a couple of stories like that. But my mind just doesn't work that way. You know, Jan can have a story where the wardrobe opens and there's a dead grandmother sitting there reading the Belfast Telegraph and whatever, you know, you, you can love different types of literature and then you realise you can only write the sort of stories that you can and my, my brain just isn't wired to make those kind of leaps. The, the, the opening story, has everybody read Intimacies? Has anybody read Intimacies? That opening story, I just thought I have... I, it was so close to the bone. The, the opening story is about a mother who um, leaves her child with a, has a toddler and a baby. baby. The baby, you know, the toddler has toddler's urgent need, urgent needs to go to the loo, and so she leaves the baby with a stranger. And it's that moment that you're not in control, and that you, you know, destiny could go in one of two, either direction. And it is, I, I have me, I, it was like somebody walked over my grave when I wrote that. Yeah, I read that. It, thank you. That story, it's, um, it was written originally for radio. I knew it had to work on the page, but I work across a lot of different forums, um, you know, novels, short stories, plays, monologues, radio, TV, drama. Um, and I think it's always the key is always being in fully in control of the possibilities and limitations of the form you're working in. And if you're writing for radio, um, the gift that you have is that you are literally that voice in someone's ear. So you have this amazing intimacy given from the start. Also, I think the way that we listen to radio, um, you know, we have it in our private spaces. You know, we have it in our cars or we have it in our kitchens. We have it in our bedrooms or we put in our earbuds to create a bubble distant from the world. So you have this intimacy. You don't even need to earn it as a writer. You have it. It's a gift. And also with radio, um, the listener is completely at my mercy. They have to go at the pace that I dictate. Um, you can't skim ahead. They can turn off the radio, but that, that's, their autonomy ends there. Um, and so with this story, it was the, the sort of banality of the toddler needs a wee and the baby has just finished breastfeeding and been put to sleep and the disabled Lou is out of order and as she lifts the baby, it'll wake. And the woman at the next table just says, look, I'll mind your baby, and she runs. And then it's just the moment that she realizes she can't even imagine what this woman looks like and she goes back rushes her toddler and her toddler of course is insisting on washing his hands correctly and drying his hands and soap and, and they get back and the buggy's still there and then she realises that the buggy hood is down and the baby's gone woman's gone but what you can do at that moment with radio is um, different scenarios so that story then um, spirals through various different scenarios and goes the length of whole lifetimes before coming back to the, the timeline. But it the, works, it works so as a short story. I suppose story. it's a sort of magic realism. It it's is a, a sort of, of yeah. yes, because yeah. you, you go on a huge journey and then, and then you're sort of curled back. But what was so clever about it was, I mean, it's quite a short story, but the, there are two scenarios which, which sort of completely pierced me. One was the scenario of being impatient to the point of violence with your toddler when you've got a baby and you have that pressure. And the other is, of course, the you know, the, the, oh, what if I forgot my baby outside the butchers or whatever it was, or, or left my, my baby with a, with a stranger. And so it holds both those within such a very um, neat and precise form. Yes, it's, um, it's interesting. I was talking, I run a masterclass. Um, I'm lucky enough to run a masterclass for favor. Um, and I, some of my, 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 my writers are, are, are here today. And we were discussing um, in my class on Thursday evening uh, the difference, maybe when you, um, it was a kind of thought and process rather than the product of a thought, but we were discussing the way that when you are looking after a young child, um, you are respond You are living in such an, a monotonous and urgent present tense. Mm. You are responding to their needs and the urgency of their needs sort of in that moment. And so we were discussing um, how much of your life gets uh, pushed into the realm of fantasy, you know, how much of you and, and who you are, and how, much, um, how much you live maybe in a, in a fantastical realm, whether that's a realm of dread or whether that's a realm of longing. And I think that with, um, with, with this story, um, it's that, that the, the stakes, when you're writing a short story, um, the stakes, you, you need to work out what the stakes are. Um, and the, the stakes, I think, when you have care of a young child, they are automatically, they're automatically high anyway, because it's so easy for something to go so terribly wrong at any moment. Mm. I once 
I, when, uh, my situation like that was when my baby, I just got my baby, new baby, month old off to sleep, and my son suddenly had a nightmare and ro- woke up shouting, and I just clapped my mouth over, my hand over his mouth, and sort of forced his head back into the pillow. I thought I nearly actually smothered my, my toddler because I was so anxious for the baby not to awake. Now, that's the sort of experience that that story evokes in anybody who's been in that situation. Yeah, and I think, um, I remember I went to a friend's book launch when I was about six months pregnant with my first child, and um, she's published by Virago, and so we had dinner afterwards with Lenny Goodings, and I was saying to her, you know, the way that I, the way that I live in the world is I read, I read my way into the world, and I was saying I've been so hungry for um, pregnancy and new motherhood in fiction, and I don't know where it is. Even, you know, this is my son is, um, he'll, be not, he'll be nine um, in, a, in about a month. So we're talking about a decade. So much has changed even in a decade. And I'd, Rachel Cusk and Anne Enright had written nonfiction, um, the, the sort of stuff that opened doorways. But I couldn't find enough fiction. We were discussing a book by Enid um, uh, Bagnold called The Squire. Um, the Persephone, I found because Persephone reissued it, but um, uh, Lenny had published it. And it's a woman... Um, who is at the laying in of her fifth child. It's a really, really great book. The book is just about the contraction of her world um, into this birthing chamber. And then they give her anaesthetic. So they knock her out for the birth and then she wakes up and the baby is there and she needs to go through that process of reconfiguring her life. And I was saying, you know, I just, I can't see these stories. Um, And Lenny kind of just said, well, you're going to have to write write your own. And I do think that if um, I looked after my children for those early years full time and... And if I hadn't had children, I think I would have written other stories, but suddenly I had this material and I had these things that felt untold and undertold. Mm. My friend, um, Yenge, Chinese-born writer, who's just published her first collection in English called Elsewhere, she has a brilliant story that you can read online. Grant had published it. And it's about um, uh, breastfeeding at a literary festival. And it's someone who's left a baby and she goes off to a literary festival in Stockholm and her event is at eight. And so she's pumped her milk ready for this and then the drinks reception goes on and she isn't done until 10 and she's engorged again and needs to work out how to deal with this. And Yen had had a traumatic experience like that at a festival. And we were talking and I said, that is a story. That is an amazing story. The stakes, the pace, everything. You know, where is the short story about a writer trying to, you know, hand express her milk so she can get the pump to latch on in the toilets before she goes in this prestigious stage. And you think, yeah, the undertold stuff and woman's fiction often gets consigned to, you know, the domestic, but we all live our lives on a domestic level. Mm. I so, um, there's Helen Simpson, but then she grew up Helen and started Simpson's to write wonderful. about older, older Yeah, women. I <laughs> love Helen Simpson. Helen Simpson's one of my favorite, favorite writers. Yeah. But then, you, then your novel that came out just after The Rapture, isn't it? Is it th- th- these days? Is, yes, is completely different. It's a family saga set in t- 1941. At the, in the bombing, which is a very unknown period of Irish history. I mean, we d- I didn't know that, that Belfast was very badly bombed by the Luftwaffe. Should, should I know? Is it w- widely known? It, yeah, I mean, comparatively speaking, it was the worst bombed city in the UK. So compared to the size of it, we lost the most people. Yeah, there are Luftwaffe pilots on record saying, you know, my God, what have we done? And in fact, Hitler ordered the suppression of the news of the Belfast Blitz because he was so worried that having bombed part of Ireland um, so badly, the damage was so bad, he was terrified it would bring the Americans into the war. And of course, they came in a few months later, not because of the Blitz. Um, But yeah, so it was this. um, And again, there's a brilliant novel by Brian Moore, who's also... Jan is a huge um, Brian Moore fan as well. There's a brilliant novel of Brian Moore's. But yeah, it's, it's again, it's one of those stories that um, it still exists within living memory, um, but it hasn't been written so much in fiction. So are you going to read, what are you going to read? Uh, yeah, well, I will <laughs> I mean, read. What do you read a bit from? Yeah, from I, I will read um, a section from, um, from these days. So, so, so this is the story at the centre of this. Although it's got lots, many, many different people at the centre of it are two sisters, two different sisters who have very different experiences. Yeah. Um, and the novel, I was, I think the most extraordinary thing that I've read in the last couple of years is Nick Laird's elegy for his father, up late, his father who died during COVID. Um, the collection with the same title has just been published, and it is, it is absolutely extraordinary. And in his elegy for his father, there's a line that says. An elegy, I think, is words to bind a grief in. And as I was writing these days, um, I wrote it during um, 
April to May. Uh, I wrote it during our lockdown. The Belfast Blitz took place during lockdown. It felt almost like I was writing it in real time. Um, one of my sisters is a palliative care doctor. My brother-in-law is a doctor. Uh, my aunt is a nurse. My cousin is um, an, oncolo uh, an oncolo a nurse oncologist. And so I was trying to find a way of um, honoring what we were living through and writing about that. So I'm going to read a session about a doctor, actually. Um, um, all of the stories that I, that I tell in this are true. Um, they would feel gratuitous, I think, but for the fact that it's trying to somehow honor and memorialize what, what, what we were going through, writing about our time as much as, as much as theirs. When Florence comes back into the dining room, Philip is still sitting at the table, just sitting. Philip, she says. He looks up from his uneaten pie. His eyes seem to take a moment to focus on hers. Was it terribly bad, she says. It's not as if we weren't prepared, he says. The windows of the side wards and the corridors had been covered over. Brick walls built, he says, to reinforce the operation theatres and the extern department. There were shelters under the wards, a reservoir built, 200 students enrolled as fire watchers. We were prepared, he says. We were well prepared. And yet? And yet, he says. And yet, how on God's earth could anyone have been prepared? Florence, the ambulances were delivering patients who'd had their limbs amputated by wardens with hacksaws to free them from rubble. There was a man whose both legs had been burned right through to the bone, the bones themselves like charcoal. From York Street he was. He died, of course. And there were so many, so many we couldn't do anything for. We gave them morphine, sent them to Ward 7 to die. The whole ward was cleared for that purpose, just to take those we couldn't do anything for. When the wards were full, we had to lie them in the corridors of outpatients, some on stretchers, some directly on the floor, some with a foot hanging off, half a face gone, blood everywhere. When the gas mains fractured and the electricity lines went down, we had to operate by tilly lamp and torchlight, and instead of proper anaesthetic, use a mixture of chloroform and ether dripped onto an open mask. I mean, my God, at times we felt more in danger from our own equipment than the bombers overhead. And then, he says, and then, to her horror, he starts to sob. Philip, she says, oh, Philip, you don't have to. You don't have to go there again. He takes a breath. You're right, dear, you're right. You shouldn't hear this. I don't know what I'm thinking. I want to hear it if it gives you ease. She is shaking now too, but I don't want to cause you distress in the reliving of it. One of the theatre nurses, Philip says, her name is Nurse McKinney. Olive. He stops. I am sorry, Philip, she says. He was decapitated, Florence. What were they thinking bringing him in? Of course, they weren't thinking. It was sheer pandemonium. And Nurse McKinney recognised him from his boots. And then before anyone had realized, before anyone could stop her, from a medallion he had inside his undershirt. Tears are rolling down his face. She wants to touch his face, to wipe the tears away, to hold him. She already knows how he would flinch away. What do we do, Florence, he says. What happens to us now? Philip, she says. All right, Philip. She can hear the hammering of her own heart. Listen to me, she says. This may sound comical, obscene even, but you haven't eaten or slept. You need to try to eat a little, and you need to try to sleep. The horror won't be diminished, but your capacity to withstand it will. He looks at her. She sees in his face the young man he was, the old man he will be, as if they are all accordion there, all at once, as if there's no such thing really as time. It will never go away, she wants to say then. None of it does, the real or the imagined. Once you have seen those images, whether with your eyes or in your mind's eye, they are etched there, seared into the body. They are there forever and you can't pretend otherwise. When they rise up, you need to try not to fight them, not to push them away. You must just focus on the smallest, most incidental thing you can. You must make yourself breathe and feel the current of breath through your body. She wants to say, do you know that grief is held in our lungs? But she knows he'll say it isn't, not in any medical sense. But it is, she thinks, it is. And sometimes, all you can do is allow your lungs to feel it. Instead, she picks up a plate, wills her hand to stop trembling. She scrapes its leftovers onto another, picks up that, scrapes the leftovers onto a third. In answer to your question, she says, we clear the lunch things and we do the washing up. I dare say you'd be no worse than Mrs. Price would be, or Betty. Her record is one dinner plate and two side plates smashed in one session. And once we've done that, we think about what's to be done about Paul. He should go away and stay with my sister and Harry, maybe, just for a few weeks. He'll be far safer out in Gilnahurk than he is here until we know what's what. She hears herself talking on, on. Don't leave me now, she thinks. 
I am here. I have come back to you. Stay with me. Here, she says, finally brisk. Take these plates for me, will you? There is a long, awful moment. Everything seems to hang in the balance. Then Philip gets to his feet. So, so that, that is not... You, you see how she balances the, the, the concrete and the sort of the wistfulness. But also it's the turning point. In a way, it's a pivot, pivot. It's a pivot in their relationship. And to some extent, it's a pivot in the novel, that scene. Um, but it's so lightly worn. Yeah, Florence. Um, funnily, although the novel is built about two sisters, that's a publisher's blurb. For me, the, it's really a, the mother is, I think, maybe my favourite character in it. And you realise that she's just been going through the motions of her life. Um, the young man she was in love with died at the Somme. Um, and, you know, and we all, there's such a, an unreckoned with force of history. Um, in Northern Ireland, you see it again and again and again. And, and you see you know, the way Jan approaches it in terms of the trauma that's passed on and how do you reckon with that. Um, and she just, she's been, she's been, part of her soul really was left at the Somme when this young man died, as with so many in Northern Ireland. And she, she, she lives really, she's going through her life. She can't believe that she's had children and they've grown up and, and her life is, is she's getting old. Um, she's getting middle-aged, she feels. And, and she hasn't been there present for much of her life really. Yeah, she's lived a lot of it in, in kind of other realms in the past. Mm. Um, was this, where did you find this material? Did you, did you do a, a huge amount of research for it? Or? I did, I love, I love the research for it. Um, it. Funny, it came about my son when he was little. He loved the book Peepo. Here's little baby, one, two, three, sits in his cot, what does he see? And I had to read that to him night after night after night after night. And I started thinking, um, there was a Belfast Blitz. My dad has stories, you know, my grandma had stories that I, I never quite got out of her enough before she died. And, and so I started in the winter of 2019 collecting these stories. And then as we came into um, 2020, there was an urgency to collecting these stories. I was arranging appointments to speak to people and... Um, and quite often they'd say, oh, love, I've got nothing to tell you. You know, and they'd be children during the Blitz. What, you know, I spoke to mainly women in their 80s, 90s, one woman who was 103. Um, and they would tell me these stories. And, um, and you would think, sometimes I would set up an appointment to speak to someone. And then when the time came, they would no longer be with us because those are the people we were losing first. Mm. And I was lucky enough to be able to have a conversation with Hilary Mantel, one of my favorite, favorite writers. Um, but an email conversation, I never got to meet her, but we talked about um, collecting those stories, you know, the precious thing of, of collecting these stories and, and making something of them. Mm -hmm. it, felt very, it felt very urgent as I was doing it. It felt, um, it felt like a, a quest, it felt like a mission. It mm -hmm. felt really important. So in both of these novels, there, there is, there's a, a, a big history in the background but it doesn't press out of the story. So in, in the case of this novel, there's a lovely story of a train journey um, at crossing the border and getting... T tell us about that. Yeah, that story is actually, if any of you want the literary provenance, that's Glenn Patterson's mum's story. <laughs> um, she was a little girl who, um, whose shoes were taken by the, the men when she was on the, on the train. Um, there's probably a bit of um, Joan Lingard, um, the file on Fraulein Berg in there as well. Um, and so, yeah, it's a story that... Um, what, what I thought is that what I was trying to write about the Blitz, um, and as J Jan will speak to this as well, you know, you grow up in a, at a place and time like we did, and, um, or in COVID, you know, in lockdown, and the Blitz, life goes on. You know, you don't get another chance to turn six or to have your baby or to whatever it is. You don't, there's an epigraph that I have to my novel by Sylvia Townsend Warner, and she says, um, uh, no one in wartime can quite escape the illusion that when the war ends, things will snap back to the way they were and that one will be the same age as one was when it began and able to go on from where one left off. But the temple of Janus has two doors and the door for war and door for peace are equally marked in plain lettering, no way back. The dead are not more irrevocably dead than the living are irrevocably alive. And that's, I mean, Jan, you know, the, we grow up in a place and time where you just have to, you carry on, you... you I mean, I think... Hannah I, is the prime example of that. Yeah, and I, I, I think that the Blitz, um, in my other life, before I, I, or when I was just starting writing, I worked as a um, community arts officer in the Ulster Hall, which is a huge heritage building in Belfast, and we did a lot of work around the Blitz. And I remember watching a documentary at one stage where 
the night of the blitz, there were a couple of very heavy nights of shelling and then there was a fear that it would continue and it, it didn't, but people still left their houses and went up Cave Hill to try and get out of the city. And there was this piece of footage from the shipyards in East Belfast were targeted a lot and the houses around there. And there were men who worked in the shipyards and they were on double shifts because they were trying to build boats for the war effort. They came home that night after their shift and the, the whole street had disappeared where their families lived and they spent hours looking for their families. And then they went back and did another shift in the shipyards. And that broke me. I remember watching it and thinking, just the stoicism of these people that they're going to keep going and Winston Churchill actually wrote a letter to Belfast after them that period to say if it hadn't been for that stoicism of particularly the Belfast shipyard workers that the war would possibly have been lost but I also thought it just spoke a lot to the Northern Irish spirit because we don't give up and sometimes it's actually quite good to give up to lie down on the floor and say this is too much for one human being to take I don't have to go back to the shipyards and build more boats when I don't know where my wife and children are. Um, and some of those, some of those um, kind of inherited values are wonderful and commendable, and some of them become really unhealthy if we pattern those to our children. So I'm all for, at the minute, teaching our, our kids in Northern Ireland good mental health practice and how to say, look, I've had enough, this is too much. Um, because they've, a lot of people in the north have been through an awful lot. Mm. Yeah, go on. It's so interesting. I think sometimes, um, I don't think that a writer has roles, <laughs> has responsibilities, but one of the things that I think a writer is maybe close to is understanding um, those blueprints that we operate along that we're not even sure what you know, where they came from, what they are, you know, almost those software programs that are running on our hardware that we can get rid of. One, a big one for me was um, the pram in the hallway is the enemy of art. You know, I always wanted children. I was always equally terrified that having children would be the, the complete end of any life that I had um, as a writer, as a creative person. And for some writers, you know, we, there are so, we don't, we need, um, different models, different pathways, different blueprints. And Jan, and Jan does so much work with um, community arts and young people. And you do realize like that, um, that stoicism, that resilience is perhaps a blueprint that um, you can question. You can question what this story is that you're telling yourself about who you are and why you're the way that you came to be. And, and you can work out, um, is there another story that I would rather live? Is there something else that I could explore instead? Or even just the ability to vocalize, I'm not OK. Um, I, I don't know why, but I tend to circle around. In all of my books, there are these men who can't talk. And there's the father, very much so in the raptures, who just He's really screwed up and he can't vocalize that, you know, he's not okay with his little girl getting sick and very, being very ill. And I, I saw that pattern a lot in Northern Ireland, particularly with men who have seen terrible things. So some of them have done terrible things as well. And they need to have a good cry and they need to talk about it. And yet it just all gets bottled up in here. Almost similarly to that whole generation of young men that came back from the front you know, um, Lucy has talked about the psalm. There were so many men who came back and had had similar experiences and then just bottled them up for generations. Yeah, and then you look at things in Northern Ireland in particular, like uh, the rates of teen suicide. And you think that the generation um, that, you know, that Lyra McKee would have called the peace babies generation, those born after the, the violence was supposed to have ended, there's the highest rate of suicide, especially among young working class males. Those are the least prospects, those are the least feeling of investment or stake in society. But you think um, it feels no coincidence that, that on one level a sort of violence ends, but then that's still there, where does it go? And it gets turned inward. It gets turned inward, domestic violence, misogyny, racism, homophobia, all of these types of... Um, we, need, we need different ways of, of talking, different stories. So Jan, your last book, Firestarters, was much more in this vein, was it? Much, dealt much more straight up with the political situation yeah, yeah. In, a more, in a sort of less allegoric or allegorical way. Yeah, um, it looks at kind of, it's kind of um, the legacy of violence in young loyalist men um, and, well, masculinity and loyalism, I guess. Um, and I, I wanted to write a kind of, I didn't realise I was doing this, but I, 
I now I realised I wanted to write a trilogy that looked at some of the big pillars of particularly Protestant culture in Northern Ireland. So the, the Firestarters really looks at the kind of political violence. This one looks at religion and the role that kind of the Protestant religion has had. And that hasn't ex been explored that much. There's been an enormous amount of work done on some of the hypocrisy and injustice and um, abuse even in the Catholic Church. You better, you know, you'd be naive to think that stuff wasn't going on in the Protestant church as well, but it hasn't really been talked about in the context of Northern Ireland. So that the rapture starts to look at that. And then I'm just finishing up a book that looks more at kind of like culture and kind of mythology and all of that kind of stuff. So, so there's the Protestant religion, hellfire preachers, basically. Yeah. But then you also have superstition. There's the, the yeah, tree. Um, I mean, my fancy way for saying this is that the, the Raptures looks at the kind of interplay between, wait for it, ma magic, myth, and the miraculous. <laughs> um, and that shows that I'm a Presbyterian because all Presbyterian sermons have three points and they go for alliteration. So I can do that too. Um, I guess I was brought up in a culture, Presbyterianism is very Calvinistic. So a real horror of anything miraculous, anything kind of you know, speaking in tongues, healing, any of that, we don't do it. But I also find all of these elderly men that were practicing cures. So they were like, you know, if you get chicken pox, rub a potato on it and bury it in the back field and you'll be fine. And that to me became really inst instantly very fascinating. You know, where is the line between like holy miracles? Because we don't do those, those are a bit Catholic. And rubbing potatoes on people. Um, so there's a lot of exploration of where the line is there. Mm -hmm. um, and in the centre of this, the, if I was, you know, was saying that's a turning point, that, that scene, that, that dinner scene, it, the 12th of July in your novel is a sort of turning point, a crux point, isn't it? It feels like it's the fulcrum around which the novel yeah. revolves. But it's going on in the background, because <laughs> Hannah doesn't really know what Do it you know, means. I'm just realising this when you say this, Claire, like the, of the th those three novels, the 12th is the turning point in all three of them. <laughs> And I think that just is because the 12th of July is such a central facet of Protestant culture. So to explain it in case um, people... So on the 12th of July, um, Orange Men, which are the kind of... I don't know how you'd explain Orange Men. Uh, they're a bit like the Masonic of extreme loyalism. That's probably someone's going to be cross for me saying that. Um, they march to celebrate the Battle of the Boyne, which happened a very long time ago. And it can be quite contentious because they often, um, in the past, have marched through Catholic areas, and that can be quite offensive. Um, in the in the raptures, the twelfth is or the fire starters, the twelfth is a big celebration because it's about men who are from that world and think it's this is basically Christmas birthday and everything all rolled into one when it's the twelfth. In the raptures, it's apolitical. These are religious people who don't have anything to do with politics or paramilitaries because that's the world, it's dirty stuff. So the 12th kind of sits in the background there and it's all about avoiding it yeah. in a way. But the avoidance is completely key to yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm just thinking of the new one where it sits as well, so yeah. Oh, there you go, that's interesting. It's all, these things are always in the book, aren't they? These, these, these sort of... Um... But I, I don't think it's, I mean, I, I, Lucy can speak into this as well. I've, I said it this morning in the Agatha Christie panel, Writers don't often sit down and very carefully mark out, oh, I'm going to make the 12th, the central point in my trilogy of books about the Protestant culture. It's just, you're writing from this place where you're so immersed in the story that that comes out naturally. And it's only when like people who are well-read like you read it and go, oh, the, I think the 12th is a turning point in these books. <laughs> you immerse yourself in a story and the characters and then you let them tell you their world. And I think these things start to come out quite naturally. How, yeah. how do you feel about that, Lucy? Yeah, I feel that quite often when your work is read, academics, critics, um, people look for the commonalities. But actually from the inside as a writer, what I'm trying to do is, I've written one book, I've written it in the first person present tense, I want to try something else. Or I've written a book, um, I've done this technically, I want to try something else, I want to try something different. And so it feels more like snooker balls, you know, hitting off each other or a deliberate attempt to try something new. And then of course, you realize that we do have these uh, vortices that we, we do come back to. I think it can be so interesting sometimes if you look at a writer like William Maxwell, you know, the book, his first book and his last book, 
are a conscious retelling of the same story. He's a New Yorker um, fiction editor, and um, he wrote a book about um, his um, mother dying in the influenza epidemic. And it's so interesting when you read both those books and you think, here's a young man's book, and here's an old, older man haunted still by the same story, retelling it with the perspective of all those years. And so sometimes, you know, you're, you're conscious of the things that you, you're repeating, uh, but also you're seeking to do new things or to try new things, um, you know, psychically go different places as well, I think. Right, I'm going to, we've got about five minutes left, so I want to find out if anybody else has a question to ask that you want the answer to. Do we have any questions? Yes. Yeah. It's a question for Jan and Lucy, but separately. Okay. And it's a question about voice. Uh, Jan, you said Hannah is based on you. Like yeah. There is some bit of you in Hannah. So where does your voice stop and Hannah's begins? One, where, how do you make that distinction? Um, I don't think there is. With Hannah as the character, that like, there are huge pieces of verbatim text in here that are actual conversations that I had with my parents that I just lift it and put in Hannah's voice because they were so pivotal conversations for me that I remember them. Like, the, you know, the day that I asked, what is a Protestant? I'm a Protestant, what is that? And I can still remember the things that were said to me. So I just put those in verbatim because I feel that's the most accurate. Um, and I'm also really lazy as well. Um, I think what, what is confusing for me is the narrative voice in the raptures, is that voice that I read there that's the more omniscient voice, that's my voice as well. Um, so I think I am God in this book. But that And might you're also the village to some extent, aren't you? Yeah, but I, I think the God thing is really important because this was my making, making sense of my relationship with God and religion book and in a way making myself the God of it, the narrative omniscient presence felt a little bit kind of, um, I don't know, like redemptive. <laughs> Thank you. I love this question. Is it the same question? No, it's a different question, but it is related. You, in the, as I think through the course of the talk, you made two comments about motherhood. One, that you thought when you became a mother, you always wanted children, but the thought that you would have children would completely derail your creative life. And second, that I think in the first story of intimacy, you said if you weren't a mother, you wouldn't have been able to write that story. Now, I haven't read any of your work, but I'm just saying what difference do you, motherhood is so pivotal as a change in a person's life, what difference do you see in your voice? Like? Oh, this is, again, this is, a, this is a good question. I could answer either of these questions. Um, I wrote my first novel at university, so I was very young, and um, it was published shortly after, and um, it was first person present tense. I found it impossible to write in third person past tense because I think there's no such thing as neutral desc description is opinion, you know, and who, who am I to presume on behalf of my characters? Who am I to describe the world? What I could do is I could ventriloquize and I think that's the playwright in me. Um, you know, I've, I've, at the same time I was, um, I had a play on at the Royal Court here, I was playwright in residence of the National, I was, and playwriting you sort of, diff you're, you inhabit all of the characters and you do their voices and, um, and Funnily, my first couple of novels, um, it never quite felt that they were written in my own voice, whatever that was. It never quite sounded, flashes of it sounded like me, but it didn't, never quite did. And then actually I had a very traumatic um, birth with my son, and, um, and he was very ill shortly after, in and out of intensive care wards. And I feel that I went to that place. I, 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 if, I feel like I touched the veil between worlds, between life and death. And I came back from there with a new sense of courage, I think. You know, when you're a young writer, when you, 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 your first novel is published when you're 23 and you're critiqued and you have, you, I, I felt very frozen, I felt very self-conscious. Um, and suddenly I had a fearlessness. I, I came back with, I didn't care what anyone said. I didn't care what they thought of me. Um, at the same time, I realized that um, there were these stories that I always thought that I'd tell at some point, maybe when I was good enough. Um, and suddenly, time, I don't think you necessarily have to have a child to have the sudden birth into time, but you understand time and mortality in a different way. And suddenly I didn't have very much time to work in, so the time that I had became really precious. And so suddenly I found myself writing the stories and telling the stories that I really felt um, I needed to tell. And something about my voice came from there, I think. And with that question of voice, I think um, I grew up playing the violin 
playing Suzuki violin from when I was about four or five. And with Suzuki, you listen and you repeat. And so I'm always attuned to, for me, it's not so much voice, it's a sort of tonal thing. Um, and so I will let my character speak in my head. I'll be walking down the street, hearing them in my head, hearing the patterns of their speech. Um, and with, to take one example, my story, um, all the people were mean and bad. I thought about that story for a full year before writing a word of it. And the day that I realized um, it was an elegy, um, it starts off with, uh, it's someone whose cousin has died. It starts off with, um, you know, you were on a night flight back to London from Toronto. I realize it is literally an elegy, but I realize the tone also is elegy. It's an elegy for all the people that she thought she was that she isn't. It's an elegy from the distance that she's come, from the place that she grew up in, which is evangelical, and the place that she's ended up. It's an elegy for all the people that she will no longer be. It's an elegy for how far she's fallen short of the ideals that she thought she had for herself. And as soon as I could hear that that story was an elegy, I wrote it in two days, and the draft changed very, very little. So for me, that question of, I suppose I'm thinking it's a tonal thing, and it's also maybe a, a, a courage thing. Thank you. I think, I think that's all we've got time for. Um, do you, they, Lucy is going to sign, because there are books in the tent. I'm not sure whether there are any. But I am going to, because I am so keen to get the, both of these books into the re hands of readers. I know there are some of, of yours, which I never received, so I read yours on P PDF. I, I, I wait the finished copy. But I'm willing to sell this to anybody <laughs> for the c copy price, which then goes to Jan, because I, and you get it signed. And I would very much like somebody to go away with the copy who hasn't read it, because it's wonderful, and oh. to take it. So uh, thank you very much for coming along, and thank you, Jan and, and Lucy.